of all the mysterious things um, in the world around us, I think possibly the most mysterious of all is time. We all have a very, very strong sense of time, and in particular, what is the future and what is the past. And yet it turns out, when you really come to look at it, this is one of the most mysterious things in the whole of physics. Let me start off by showing you a little movie. Um, and I hope I can operate this machine successfully. I may not be able to, but let's try it anyway. Um, so, let's just make sure. Oh, yes, that's fine. Yes, okay, here we go, here we go, here we go. Yes. Now, oh, <laughs> good point, good point. Um, I have to warn you I'm a theoretical physicist, so. Uh, um, so, we, okay, we've got to try to do that one again, I think. Uh, so let us try to take it off. Um, I think I'm just going to play. Let's see if we can play and if that does it. Yes, here we go. Here we go. Yes. Now, you see? Now. Now, did you notice anything peculiar about that <laughs> movie? I mean, Caitlin and Wendy, the two young ladies involved here, I'm sure they're very athletic, but um, <laughs> this is a bit much, isn't it? So let's um, actually try to do this a bit differently. Let's um, see if I go from there, hopefully. Oh, no, that's not going to work. Oh, no. Um, see. Uh, yeah, here we go. Um, let's try this one now. Um, and see if we can get that to work. Um, again, we... Um, sorry. <laughs> we have to give me... Uh, um, pardon me for a little clumsiness in this. Yeah, here we go. Oh. So, nothing peculiar about that, right? Um, so, obviously, the, the first clip I showed you was uh, just the second one run backwards, and I think you most of you recognise that. Let's just do that once, once again with something a bit different. Uh, put that off. Yes, here we go. Um, so, now let's do um, this one here. Um, and um, we will try to... Oh yeah, okay, so one moment, let's just make it full size. Yes, here we go. Okay. Okay, that's, okay, that's one way round. And now, um, hopefully we can... Uh, okay, there we go. Okay, we can hopefully now do this one. Um, which one do? Again, you see, you, you recognise that um, that's being run backwards. Okay, well, um, so we all know. Uh, I, I could show you any, any number of other uh, movies if I had them. I could, for example, show you um, a movie of a kettle unboiling. I could show you a movie of, a, of water um, on a table, at a puddle on a table, reconstituting itself and, get, and getting into a glass, which then writes itself. Okay. I could um, show you a poker, say, um, you know, heating up even though there's no fire around. Okay. And you, you know in each of these cases that I was showing the movie backwards. Now, why is that uh, puzzling in any way? Well, the problem is that, at least as far as we know, the basic laws of physics um, do not distinguish between forwards and backwards. That is, they don't have a built-in arrow of time. Now, if I say this um, and don't qualify it, I'm certainly going to get some flack from some of my high-energy colleagues because um, they will, of course, remind me that that's not totally true. There is, in fact, one uh, phenomenon which we've discovered in recent years in high-energy particle accelerators and uh, which um, does seem to have a built-in sense of time. Uh, but... Um, I think just about everyone who's thought about it seriously agrees that this is just a sort of puzzling, well, it's not just, it, it is, it's a, it's a very, very intriguing phenomenon, but it, it's a puzzling anomaly, and it does not seem to be relevant to most of the things I'm going to be talking about in this talk. So I just remember that it's there, and it, we might have to bear it in the back of our minds, but um, uh, for most of this talk, I'm, I'm going to pretend it isn't, as it were. And uh, I think, uh, in fact, that this will be quite satisfactory. So if we exclude that, um, uh, that, that exception of this very puzzling phenomenon in particle physics, then all the laws of nature which we know about or believe in right now do um, seem not to distinguish between past and future. Let's just think about that for a moment. 
Let's think about good old Newton and his three, three laws of motion. Newton's first law says that everybody remains in a, a state of rest or uniform motion as long as it's not being acted on by an external force. Well, clearly there's no reference in, in that to past or future. So uh, uh, clearly it doesn't distinguish them. Newton's third law says that each um, action is subject to an equal and opposite reaction. Um, in other words, if, um, if I exert a certain force on this desk, then the desk exerts a certain force on me, which is equal and opposite. Again, nothing in there to distinguish past or future. Now, it's the second law, which is a slightly tricky one. So let me, now let me show you a, a view graph at this point, and uh, I, I should say right away, this is the only bit of mathematics I'm going, to sh I'm going to use during this talk, so don't be frightened if you, you know, even if it's something you're perhaps uh, not, not totally used to. So, okay. So let's see, we, um, okay, my laser point. Um, okay, here we are. So, um, let us, uh, this, what I'm trying to describe in this view graph is something a very simple, a uh, little experiment like, say, this, okay? So uh, a ball is being thrown up and is falling again under the, the influence of gravity. Um, what did I um, do with my pointer? Yes, here we are. Um, hopefully, um, um, sorry. Um, try this one. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Um, so Newton's second law tells us that force is mass times acceleration. In this case, we're talking about the force of gravity of the Earth. Well, the um, force uh, is well, it's just gravity. Uh, that's not telling us anything about past or future. Mass, again, the mass is just the mass of the, of the ping pong ball, of the golf ball. Um, again, that doesn't tell us anything about past or future. What about acceleration? Acceleration is the rate of change of velocity or speed. So let's think about that for a moment. Um, if I go, go uh, from... Point, this point here, time t1, this point here, time t2, then the velocity over this interval, v1, the average velocity over this interval, is z2 minus z1 over t2 minus t1. Let's call that delta t uh, for short. Um, and if in the same time interval here, it goes from z2 to z3, then its average velocity over this bit is z3 minus z2 over t3 minus t2. We've agreed that the, the, the time intervals taken here are actually the same. So that's again delta t. So now to find the acceleration, I take the velocity here minus the velocity, uh, velocity here minus the velocity here, and divide it by the, uh, the time difference. And there's a slight, uh, a slight complication here which I'll uh, sweep under the rug. I should basically be talking about the difference between here and here, but uh, it's the same, in fact. So um, we find at the end of the day that the acceleration is given by this expression here, which involves only the heights. And then this expression here, and you see that in this expression here, t2 minus t1 is coming in squared. And therefore, if I interchange t2 and t1 in this formula, it, the acceleration is unchanged. In other words, what this is saying is not just the first and third law, but also Newton's second law, works just as well backwards as forwards. So again, you see, if you, um, I would um, suspect that if you were to take a movie of that, me doing this backwards, you would not know that it was being shown backwards. And just to illustrate that point, let me show you a movie which we actually do have. And this is a movie of a, um, an air track, uh, which a demonstration which we use in the physics labs. Um, let's see, where's it gone? Yes, here we are. Um, yes, now, um, start. Sorry? Yeah, oh, right, uh, yes, uh, thank you, yes. Right, um, so we will, uh, let's see. Um, is this one here? Um, here we go. Yes. Okay. Uh, let me just try, try to enlarge that actually, um, if I can, so that you can see it more clearly. Um, so, um, right, may have to mess around with this for a minute. Um, yeah, here we go. Okay. Fine. Um, okay, so that's that one. Now, um, uh, uh, let me just uh, show you another one, um, which is uh, we've got to um, here. Um, okay, I've got to, um, again, we'll try to amplify it. Um, try to, no, I don't think we'll 
Okay, here we go. Um, no, um, let's see. Now, which of those was uh, which of those is the right way round, and which is the wrong way round? Huh? No, no bets. Incidentally, I'm going to ask you occasionally for a vote um, in, in, in during this talk. And oh yeah, one other thing before I forget. Sorry, I should, this is something I should have said right at the start. Uh, please do feel free, um, especially the high school students, but anyone in fact, to interrupt at any time during the talk to ask, ask questions. And I will be asking, and that, that applies to anyone, I, I will be asking for a vote occasionally during this talk, and I do, don't think that my professional uh, colleagues, that is physics, faculty, graduate students, or undergraduate students, should vote in, in, in those votes so as not to pass the samples. So, <laughs> but everyone else can vote. Okay, so, um, well, in fact, uh, it, uh, as, as it turns out, uh, I showed you this particular uh, clip the wrong way around the first time and the right way around the second. But you see there's absolutely no way, really, that you could have told uh, that, that, that was true. It could have been uh, either. And interestingly, in this particular case, that's true even though you have a couple of human, humans involved. Um, it's, it's obviously much more so very often if you don't have humans involved. Um, okay, so that's Newton's laws. Well, but then people say, well, but wait a moment, surely there are things in physics which, are, uh, which know the difference between past and future. Uh, for example, um, suppose that I have an electron and I've put it in a magnetic field then it is going to spiral around that magnetic field and it's going to go one way if I run the film the right way around and the other way if I run it backwards. Okay? Well, that's true. But um, and what you have to realise is that when you run things backwards, when you run everything backwards, as it were, then what you've got to do, among other things, is to reverse the current which gave rise to the magnetic field. So the magnetic field is now itself reversed. So in fact, everything comes out just the same in that case. Um, one more thing that I should just mention, because some of you might have possibly heard about it, um, is quantum mechanics. Uh, if you've met uh, elementary quantum mechanics, then at first sight, uh, it looks as if it does know uh, the difference between past and future, because what you normally do is to uh, prepare uh, your system at some uh, initial time, and you assign to it a so-called wave function, a quantum state, and then you let it evolve from there, and that uh, evolution, the evolution is as it were one way round. So at first sight it looks as if quantum mechanics at least does not know the difference between past and future. And then it turns out unfortunately that's not true either. It turns out that uh, you can perfectly well write a version of quantum mechanics which is completely symmetric with respect to past and future. That's a very technical issue so, and I don't want to discuss it in any detail but I just put it in for completeness. So quantum mechanics doesn't actually help you here. Now <laughs> So, so there's no, um, uh, in, in the basic physics that we know about, then there's no obvious basis for this distinction between past and future. I now want to raise a slightly different point. This is uh, not, not quite the same kind of point, but it's still a very interesting one, I think, and it's somewhat connected with the original one. And this has to do with the question of whether the past causes the future. Here's, uh, here's a, a, a little sketch of a uh, cannon firing a cannonball. And our natural instinct is to say, well, the ball, the cannon actually fired the ball uh, at a particular time here. So initially, at that particular time, it had some position just outside the cannon and some initial velocity or speed. And therefore, it followed this trajectory and eventually landed up here at a later time. And um, so it's very tempting to say, well, uh, it was because it, uh, it was fired in this particular way that it arrived here. Now think about that for a moment. Um, well, certainly if we know the initial position and velocity, and there's no friction acting on, on the system in question, so we can neglect air resistance and so forth, then we can calculate its exact trajectory and predict that it will arrive here at that final time. So that tempts us to say that the initial conditions cause the subsequent motion. And there's a very famous, um, uh, famous sort of thought experiment in this context, which is due um, to the uh, French uh, 19th century, uh, 18th century, I guess, um, 18th century mathematician and physicist Laplace, where he imagined that you had a, um, a demon whose 
uh, who had um, infinite powers of observation and so forth. And so this demon knew exactly what every particle in the universe was doing at, 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 at uh, some particular time, say now. And then this demon uh, is provided with some kind of supercomputer. Of course, Laplace didn't have a supercomputer, but uh, had he been alive today, he would have said that. Um, so he's provided with a supercomputer, and he can actually follow Newton's laws. Remember, they didn't know about quantum mechanics in those days, so they didn't have to worry about that. Um, so he follow Newton's laws and predict exactly where every particle in the universe was going to be at any time in the future. Um, and uh, one of the things that tends to worry people um, uh, about Laplace's uh, uh, thought experiment is that at least at first sight, it looks a bit difficult to reconcile this with the idea of free will, the idea that the future is not completely fixed, that we, in some sense, can affect it. Well, let's put that question aside for a moment and just ask, is it really true in this case that the initial conditions are causing the subsequent motion? Well, it turns out that provided again we have no uh, air resistance and so forth, uh, then if we know the final position and velocity here, uh, we can perfectly well uh, determine the initial values. So rather than saying that the uh, initial conditions cause the final state, we could equally well say the final conditions cause the initial state. In fact, it's even more co complicated than that. We could get uh, either of these out of the intermediate position of velocity, and even more remarkable, if we know um, the, uh, that at some initial time the, the ball was here, and we further know that it was here, we can then use Newton's laws to predict the whole of the trajectory. So the whole idea of cause appears to have somehow um, gone up in thin, in thin air at this point, uh, at least at this level where we're dealing with perfectly, in some sense perfectly idealized and isolated systems, there's really no basis for saying that it's the past which causes the future, rather than it's the future that caused the past, or if you like, the future and past together cause the present. So life gets more and more puzzling. Well, um, one of the things you'll notice is that uh, in these examples I've showed you, where you, uh, in some sense, there appears to be exact symmetry between the past and future, is that we're dealing with very, very simple um, systems, uh, with cannonballs or, or with um, an, uh, uh, something going down an air track or with this, uh, 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 this golf ball or whatever. Um, what happens when we deal with much more um, complicated systems? It's usually in these cases of much more complicated systems that we can e easily tell the difference between the past and future. And here is a typical example. Very simple um, thought experiment, which we can actually do in practice if we want to. Um, let's imagine that we uh, have a box and we partition that box into um, two parts with some kind of rigid uh, wall here. And we start off with a, a gas. Um, here are all the atoms of the gas, and they're confined to one side. And now we um, pull, the, uh, pull, pull, uh, pull the partition away, and you see the gas now expands to fill the whole of the box. Now, we all know intuitively that this is not, that, I mean, once we pull, we have actually, of course, have to pull the partition away, but once we've done that, the gas just does what it wants to, and it ends up in this state here. We all know, uh, at least we all, all guess, that this would not happen backwards. That is, we would not get the gas starting off in a state like this and ending up quite spontaneously in a state like this, unless we actually took a hand in it and, and you know, uh, used a piston or something of the kind. But the gas itself certainly won't, won't do that. So that um, introduces the idea that, um, in some sense, um, the gas is going from an ordered state to a more disordered state. And so that then raises the idea that maybe um, what's happening is that disorder is always increasing towards in the direction of the future. So in other words, with our usual definition of time, disorder always increases, never decreases. But now you have to be a little careful here, because uh, the idea of, um, of disorder is actually quite subtle. I'm going to illustrate that with um, some ex little experiments with a pack of cards. Um, let me think. What I'm going to do is to ask someone, or perhaps someone in the front row could volunteer for this, uh, just to call out. Yeah? Would you like to do it? Do it? Yeah. Well, 
you really have to do is be able to recognize the, uh, <laughs> the cards. So, uh, any volunteers? <laughs> Who want to? Um, I have to, oh, okay, <laughs> fine, thank you. Okay, so uh, what I'd like you to do is just simply to turn over the, card, the top few cards in order and call them out and I will try to note down as you do the, um, these cards. And I'll use black for, um, for the black suits and red for the red suits. So if you just call out then the first card, can you? Um, a four of diamonds. So that's a four of diamonds, needs a diamond four. Okay, next one. The nine of hearts. Nine of hearts. Yes, Kate, Kate. Five of spades. Um, uh, perhaps I'll just write um, uh, 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 spade five. Yes. Six of diamonds. Uh, diamond six. Um, yes. Uh, um, the six. Yes. Right. Yes. Four of clubs um, and um, yes. Six of clubs. Six of clubs. Um, okay, that's the other people now. Um, right. Um, thank you. Now, um, okay. How many people think that I prepared that uh, uh, that deck of cards specially? That I, as it were? Yeah. Yes, you do. Okay. Uh, how many do you think it was completely random that I just sort of shuffled them? Lots and lots of people. Uh, you're absolutely right, of course. Yes. Yes. Um, okay, now let's, uh, if you don't mind, but just, uh, I'd ask you to do a couple more, if, but if someone else would like to do it, that's also fine. Um, um, so now, here's another one. This time I don't think I'm going to have to even bother to write it down, because uh, if you just read off the first, um, uh, first four or five. Yeah. Ace of... Spades? Ace of, <laughs> Sorry. Ace of spades. King of spades. King of spades. Queen of spades. Queen of spades. Jack of Spades. Good hand muscle. I hope that's right. Ten of Spades, yeah. Okay, so how many people think that was random? <laughs> no, no takers? <laughs> okay, no, well, then, of course, um, obviously I did uh, prepare them all in, in order that way. Now, finally, I'm gonna, this is a little more tricky, this one, so I think I will try to write them down as you call them out, if you would. Um, as you, uh, Okay, will you, will you do it again, or someone else would like to do it? <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks. We, we actually, we're going to need about eight, I think, this time, so, and I'll, we'll try to write them down, so. Okay. This one, King of Diamonds. Um, diamond, uh, yeah, Diamond King. Yeah. Two of Clubs. Um, two of Clubs. Nine of Hearts. Nine of Hearts. Four of Clubs. Four of Clubs. Ten of diamonds. Eight of clubs. Eight of clubs. Just come on, white Eight of diamonds. Eight of diamonds. Um, right. And last one. Seven of spades. Seven of spades. Um, so, okay. Now, how many people think that one was just shuffled randomly? Yes, yes, well, I have one or two takers. Good, good, fine. Um, and uh, how many think that it was not shuffled randomly, that I prepared them deliberately? Lots and lots of people. Yeah, well, uh, the people who, um, uh, who voted that it was uh, randomly shuffled might, might be right. There's about um, one chance in a hundred, in fact, that it came out that way. But the rest of you who didn't think it was random, why did you not think it was random? Randomly shuffled. Sorry? Red, black, red, black. Yes, of course, yes, red, black. Um, so the, the general principle, which I think you're, in, you're intuitively using in, make, in, in giving these responses, um, is that there is a, although each of these, uh, I mean, each particular sequence is just one sequence, and that particular sequence has exactly the same probability of occurring as any other. I mean, ace, king, queen, jack of spades, dot, 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 is one sequence un, uh, out of the zillions and zillions, but then so is the, uh, the other, uh, the completely random one that I showed you. Um, what we're implicitly using is the fact that there's some, some property of the uh, sequence in question which is only shared by a, a restricted number of, of states. So in particular, you see, that works particularly in the last case. In the last case, uh, yes, 
you, you have this, um, this particular sequence, which is just one, but it has this very special property that it's red, black, red, black, red, black. And the number, uh, although the number of sequences which has that property is very large compared to ace, king, queen, jack, dot, 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 it's still very small compared to the total number of possibilities that are available. So I think you were, it was quite entirely reasonable that most people guessed that that was not random, but I, I shuffled them in some way. So, um, uh, so in some sense then, um, in, when judging whether things are random or disordered, if you like, we are asking how many different, um, uh, how many different states are which have the particular property we fastened on, in this case uh, being red, black, red, black, alternate, and so forth. And so that's asking, and so one has, then has this intuitive feeling that um, uh, somehow it's much easier to get from a, a, a completely ordered state to a random one um, than vice versa. Uh, we could do it, I think it's probably not worth doing, but I could, for example, ask, um, for, are you holding a completely ordered pack of cards? Is that the disordered one? No, I want the particular, particular order one. Yes, okay. Well, why don't you, if you wouldn't mind, could you just perhaps shuffle these a little and, and uh, just take a time? I won't, won't need it for a bit. Okay. So, um, fine. So, the, remember, this was the ace, king, queen, jack uh, deck that he's shuffling. Okay. Um, so, uh, somehow we have the intuitive feeling that it's much easier to start. Okay, um, thanks. I think I'd probably do. Would you like to just read off the first three or four? Just the, Oh, you didn't shuffle very well. Queen of Diamonds, Jack of Hearts. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, well, it wasn't a perfect shuffle. But, <laughs> yeah. Okay, it wasn't a perfect shuffle, but nevertheless, it, it, uh, it, we, we all get this feeling that uh, it's easier to go um, in this uh, state from an ordered state to a disordered state. Um, and a disordered state is one which corresponds, uh, whose, whose interesting property, such as red, black, red, black, or whatever, corresponds to a larger number of states. Now, here's another illustration of that same point. Now, how many of the high school students here, how many of you are actually learning to drive at the moment? Huh? No, no? Well, well, learning to drive a car. Drive a car. Yeah. Oh, I thought it would be a lot, actually, but no, okay. Never mind. This is my next view graph. This new graph is about reversibility and parking. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so uh, of course, you all know, uh, all of us who have ever learned to drive a car knows that, for example, on your first day, let's just imagine that your instructor has got the, um, the, the, um, uh, uh, the driving school car parked at the curb uh, in a row of other cars. And he instructs you to get behind the steering wheel and to, to drive out. Fine. You uh, drive out quite happily. And then at the end of the lesson, he asks you to come back and park in this same space here. Now, you all know that the second is much, much more difficult than the first. <laughs> and at least part of this, this is actually quite, actually, if you think about it, it's not that trivial to work out why that is, but at least a part of the answer is that in the uh, when you drive out of your par parking place into the street, you're driving into a large final space here. There are lots of, of options available to you. Whereas when you're coming back, there's just this one option. You've got to be exactly there. Okay? That's not the whole story, because obviously if you had to get to a particular spot here, um, that, would, um, uh, uh, that would also be relatively easy. But, uh, so it's a, in fact, a, it's more complicated than that. It involves how many ways there are of doing it, as it were. But, but crudely speaking, you expect that the larger the final space available, the more states available, the easier it is to do, and the, and the more difficult it is to reverse. So, for example, if we were to take that deck of cards, which um, has been shuffled for us, and to try to reconstitute the original um, uh, ace-king-queen-jack queen, order, that's going to be really quite, uh, quite difficult, and it will take us some time. Um, this was um, this general idea that the direction of time is determined by going, from a, um, by going from states of low disorder to states of high disorder, um, and that disorder is proportional, or as a, as a measure, of the available space, or the number of available states, that fundamental idea is due above all to um, the great 19th century Austrian physicist Ludwig Boltzmann. Um, he, in fact, 
uh, invented a measure of disorder which is actually the logarithm of the number of available states, or if you like, the available space. And then he said that it's this quantity which always increases in time. And the entropy, the entropy is a technical term in physics, but the entropy, which we usually call S, is just a measure of disorder. And so um, the famous formula um, which, um, which says that the entropy or disorder of a particular state of a physical system is k, where k is called Boltzmann's constant, times the logarithm of the number of available states. And this formula is so uh, fundamental, it's one of the most, uh, the most basic formulae in physics, and it is in fact so fundamental that it appears on Boltzmann's tomb, which is in the Central Friedhof in, in Vienna. And uh, you see he lived from, 18, if you can read it, he lived from 1844 to 1906, and there we are, S equals K log W. There's actually something rather ironical about this, um, uh, this tombstone. Um, nowadays, we always call K Boltzmann's constant, but it was not in fact Boltzmann who first wrote it down. It was Max Planck who first wrote it down, and it said, though I don't know how true this is, that to his dying day, Planck was always a little jealous of Boltzmann and would have, would have liked K to be called Planck's constant, even though what we actually call Planck's constant is in some ways much more fundamental. So that's rather, rather amusing, I think. Anyway, so this was um, uh, this is Boltzmann's general idea, and it really uh, lies at the basis of our um, understanding of statistical mechanics. But now, if you come to think of it, there's something rather um, peculiar about this. After all, shuffling is a um, process which itself is symmetric in time. That is, if a particular uh, rearrangement of the cards is a shuffling process then the inverse of that, doing it backwards, is also a shuffling process. So let's imagine that instead of getting a, um, a, a human agent to do this for me, I was actually, um, I actually had a machine, um, a machine which was uh, shuffling the cards for me. So there's no human agency involved at all. Um, and imagine that I suddenly, uh, at some time, I stop the machine and I look at what the cards are uh, doing. And I find, lo and behold, I find ace, king, queen, jack, ten, dot, dot, dot. Space. Well, one thing um, I can most certainly infer, of course, is that if I let the machine go on shuffling, then the packet, the deck is going to get more disordered. But I can also infer something else. I can infer that if I were to go back in time and ask what the deck had been doing previously to that, by exactly the same argument, it would also have been more disordered. Okay. So I, so I have no obvious, distinct, uh, no obvious uh, reason for my uh, distinguishing past and future in this way. Um, so, um, so, 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 um, uh, how, how can I get, uh, get around this? Well, uh, Boltzmann himself got uh, around it in a very ingenious way. He said, look, um, on average, the universe is going to be in the most disordered state it possibly can be in. Um, that's my, sorry. Okay, on average, both, both directions of time have to be exactly equivalent. The, um, uh, perhaps before we, we do that, we should just, just uh, stop, um, stop for a moment and ask, you know, what would I fact, fact think? Suppose that I, I were to come across a deck of cards on the table and I find that it's highly ordered, that is, it's king, queen, jack, ten, dot, dot, dot. One, uh, one hypothesis is that maybe that was the result of a random shuffling process. Would I make that hypothesis in real life? Of course not, because I'd say no, someone has been, been along and, and ordered these cards deliberately. Right? So in other words, um, it's our human agency which is involved here, and uh, you're invoking the fact, which we all know, that human beings can prepare initial states and, uh, and then let nature take her course, as it were, but we cannot, as it were, retropair these states. That is, we can't set final conditions and then, as it were, allow things to evolve backwards in time. Okay. It seems sort of common sense, uh, just part of our everyday folk, folk knowledge. Um, so, at first sight, you'd say, well, maybe um, the, uh, the fact that order, the disorder always seems to increase 
is due to the fact that we as human beings um, can only do things one way in time, as it were. And that then in turn would be presumably be connected with the fact we, well, we, we all know that we do have a very strong sense of the direction of time. I, um, we can remember the past, we can affect the future. It would be awfully nice if um, I, uh, you know, I made this awful conversational gaffe at, a, at the party last night. It would be awfully nice if I could go back in time and correct that gaffe, but uh, alas, I know I can't. In the same way, it would be awfully nice if I knew ahead of time which horse was go going to win the race at one o'clock this afternoon. Again, uh, I know I can't. So we do, uh, so, so that would, if, if we were to uh, just use that consideration, that would say, well, maybe the so-called thermodynamic error of time uh, the fact that, say, the gas can expand but not spontaneously contract is intimately connected with the fact that we human beings can only do things one way around. And then we'd have to look for a reason for that. Why would that happen? But that doesn't quite work, unfortunately, because um, there are many, many cases. We haven't actually got any movies of them, but um, there, are, uh, there are many cases where we can tell that a movie is running backwards even though there was no human being involved at any stage. Right? Now, you see, in the case of the dominoes, it was clear, you actually saw the, uh, someone's hand reaching in and, and uh, uh, setting it off, right? Um, so a human being was involved, someone had to set up the dominoes that way. But there are many cases, if you think about it, where we also have this same kind of irreversibility where there's no question of any human being involved. For example, suppose that a rock becomes detached from the top of a cliff, falls down, um, falls into the sea, waves um, uh, radiate out from there, the rock sinks to the bottom and slacks there. Now we all know, that if we showed the, the movie in reverse, the rock would actually rise up from the bottom of the sea, the waves would come in, the rock would, would um, lift up to the top of the cliff. We all know that that's not what happens in real life. So it's not just that human beings are involved. It's also that there's a very basic uh, error of time built into nature itself, apparently. But then how can that be? Because as we say, all the laws of physics, including the ones involved in statistical mechanics, are basically the same from back to front. Well, Boltzmann was very worried about this, uh, this problem, in fact, and he actually thought out a very ingenious solution, which is very interesting because it anticipates by more than 100 years a number of uh, ide ideas which are very influential today. And what um, Boltzmann said was this. Well, um, crudely speaking, the universe will tend to a state of maximum disorder. So, um, so this is a maximum entropy or maximum disorder here. So that's that line here. And it'll, most of the time, it's going to be pretty close to that. But just occasionally, there are going to be improbable fluctuations which take me away from the state of high disorder to a low disorder state. You see, just if, if I'd gone shuffling those cards long enough, at some point, I would, you know, just by the, the, the laws of averages, at uh, some time, after millions and millions of years, I would get back to this particular ace, king, queen, jack ar arrangement. It's just that it's very improbable. Okay, so... Um, so Boltzmann said, well, uh, let's suppose that we are actually living, as it were, uh, our present universe is in one of these fluctuations. So we've gone, the universe has gone from a state of high disorder to a state of much lower disorder by a very improbable fluctuation, um, which is actually, he thought, might be confined to our local region of space. And then now we're coming out of it again. We're, we're, so we, having got there, we've got to, as it were, get back to the state of maximum disorder, so we happen to be living on this part of the graph here. So it does indeed look to us as if um, disorder is increasing. And in fact, what he said was that, of course, um, if we are living on this part of the curve, then we'll automatically identify the future as the direction in which, in which order, disorder is increasing. Right? So that's, in some sense, the future, what is future and what is past is automatic once one, uh, one knows that, that disorder is increasing in one direction and not in the other. This is very interesting because he then argued that why, okay, why are we living here? Why do we happen to be living in this particular, uh, on this particular bit of the curve? Well, um, because um, if we were not on, 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 if we were on any other bit of the curve, then in fact the physical conditions would be such that human life is quite impossible. So it's natural that if we're living anywhere, it's on, on this particular bit. And this is a very amusing early example of what, until recently at least, used to be called the anthropic principle in physics. I gather today this is politically incorrect, and then one has to talk about landscapes, but um, uh, it used to be called the anthropic principle in physics, which basically says that um, if you want to understand why, for example, the constants of, of, uh, of nature have the values they do, Note the fact that if they are anything different from what they are, we would not be here. We would not be here to observe them. 
So, um, so it's not an accident, for example, the electron charge has the value it does, etc., etc. So this is a very, uh, very uh, early application. Now, unfortunately, Boltzmann didn't know one thing. Well, he didn't know several things, but he, he didn't know one thing in particular. He thought that maybe our bit of the universe was special. That, uh, um, uh, uh, that was, because after all, these fluctuations are very, very rare, and um, we wouldn't want most of the universe to be engaged in it. So he basically thought most of the rest of the universe was high disorder, and we have just our, our immediate environment is low disorder. But unless in 2006 we've got many more space probes and so forth than he had, and it seems at least that most of the observable universe, if not all, is exactly like us. It's like us um, in particular in one very important point, namely in that stars appear to be uh, radiating outwards, not sucking in absorption. Now you see that's again not obvious. It's not obvious they should because just like the laws of mechanics, the laws of electromagnetism are also um, uh, insensitive to, to future or past. So let me just show that. Um, oh, I think we lost it. Yeah, here we go. Um, um, yeah. So let me just briefly show you one more clip. Um, Now, you see, this is a, uh, I think you can see, what, this is a picture. Oh, sorry? What, what do we need? Okay. Um, okay. Well, let's try it. Try this one. No, no, I don't think so. No, I don't think it should be so. Okay, so this is a picture of, of, of some kind of piston in a pond driving waves, which then radiate outwards. Right? And this would be like uh, an uh, uh, antenna, so radiating electromagnetic waves. Now, if we, obviously, if we um, uh, try to, um, to kind of do this backwards, you'll see that it doesn't work, really. Um, here it is hopefully going backwards. Yeah, now you see, uh, now the waves are coming in uh, from infinity, and they're ending up at the piston. And we all know that's not what happens in real life. You can't, you'd be very, very clever to stand on the edge of a pond and generate waves which come in and, and hit exactly right at this point here. So, um, uh, 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 so, so the, uh, as far as we know, the laws of electromagnetism allow um, a, a source to radiate outwards, or alternatively, for the waves to come in. But we all know that only one of them happens in real life around us. So, uh, in particular, our sun radiates energy and uh, uh, does not uh, suck it in from, uh, from infinity. And that appears to be the case throughout the whole of the universe that we can observe at uh, present. So, um, so, this suggests the following picture. Um, where are we? Let's see, sorry, I seem to have some to be. Yep. Um, there we are. Yep. The standard, uh, this is now um, more or less the standard um, uh, scenario for what's going on. Um, conventionally, one defines five different arrows of time, so-called. The first one is this funny one, which I mentioned at the beginning, um, which is the one which you find only in high, right now only in high-energy accelerator experiments and similar things, and similar experiments, and is believed not to be really uh, particularly relevant to this discussion. Then you have the thermodynamic error of time, which basically says that, that uh, disorder tends to increase uh, with time. You have the biological or psychological error of time. Well, that, um, are they the same or different? Well, who knows? I mean, we are, um, uh, we are born as infants, uh, we grow old, and eventually uh, we die um, as, um, uh, um, as old people. Um, not the other way around. We're not, not born fully fledged and then gradually contract and, uh, and disappear as infants. Um, the psychological error of time basically says that, well, we can remember the past and aff affect the future, not vice versa. And it seems, well, it seems at least very, very plausible that those really are not, diff uh, are not two different errors, that they are closely tied together. But we don't necessarily know completely. There's the electromagnetic error of time, which I already mentioned, that stars, for example, or gen more generally, sources of radiation radiate outwards and, not, and don't suck radiation in. And finally, there's the cosmological error of time, which I'll discuss in a moment. 
And the general, the general view, um, which I think is not obviously uh, East, although it's not, uh, not something you can prove uh, rigorously, is that um, in some sense the thermodynamic error of time is a result of the com combination of the electromagnetic error of time with the inanimate object, so that the sun is radiating, not, not drawing in uh, radiation. And in the case where humans are involved, it's obviously a consequence of the biological or psychological error of time. Basically what they're saying is that I know that I, I, when I saw my deck of cards um, that were exactly ordered, then I could legitimately assume that a human being had prepared it in the past, right, and allowed it to go. And that's because I know that human beings, as it were, work one way around in time, not, not, not the opposite way. So those three by themselves, um, uh, it's not obviously absurd to assume they're all connected. The big question is whether it's the cosmological error of time can determine the rest. Now, what do I mean by the cosmological error of time? Well, the most obvious, um, uh, the most fundamental thing we know about the universe right now um, is that it appears to be expanding. Um, so, uh, our current picture of the universe, using, uh, running time forwards in the way that we normally do, is that if I plot the size of the universe, or the scale of it, up here, and time along here, then I start off with a big bang, in which the universe was infinitely um, dense, and then it gradually expands from there. And it might go on expanding forever, and that's the so-called open universe. And we are on the, this, this point on the curve, and this is about 14 million years after the Big Bang. And so, so cosmology does appear at first sight by an error of time, in the sense that the, the universe is expanding forward in time, not contracting. But that then raises the question, if I'm going to use that to explain, say, the thermodynamic or electromagnetic error of time, um, why is disorder low at the small end and not the big end? Um, and uh, now we really get to, to uh, the issues which have been uh, strongly debated and uh, are caused strongly held opinions among some of the most em eminent people in the subject, people like uh, um, uh, Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose and so forth, who've certainly thought deeply about these things. And the uh, striking thing is that there is no agreement on this point. A very fundamental point indeed, you might think, and there is no agreement on it. And to show you um, the nature, uh, the kind of problems that come up, um, let's just imagine, we said that um, this is a picture, in this particular picture, I've drawn it so that we're here and the universe is going to go on expanding, although some, perhaps rather slower, forever. And that's a so-called open universe. And cosmologists believe that if the mass density or the energy density in the universe is below a certain threshold, that's what's going to happen. However, we don't know ahead of time that it is below that threshold. And in fact, there's increasing evidence it may not be. In which case, we have a sort of so-called closed universe, and things really become rather more, more intriguing and fascinating. Um, here we go. Oh, is our closed universe? Yes. So now you see, uh, if, if the energy density is above a certain uh, threshold, what's going to happen is that we have the Big Bang, we're sitting here, the universe is still expanding. But eventually, it's going to go through a maximum and decrease again to infinitely high density. That's usually called the big crunch. And so now the, the fascinating question which arises is, suppose we are coming down, as we're on this end of the curve, coming down um, to the big crunch. Is disorder increasing or decreasing? Um, would it be possible for human beings to, as it were, see the direction of the future uh, in the direction of the contracting universe. Uh, in other words, to, to say we are heading into the big crunch, or would rather any humans who happen to be around at this time automatically say, well, the future is in this direction, not this one. Um, and that, of course, <laughs> raises the, the even more, um, uh, uh, more amusing problem. Just suppose, it seems extremely unlikely, but just suppose that the, this is indeed what the universe is going to do, and suppose that we've, we humans have somehow managed not to blow ourselves up in the smithereens in the intervening few million, billion years, um, what is going to be our experience as we go through this point here? In other words, are we going to say, ah, help, I don't know which is future and which is past? Or are I going to go on gaily saying that this is future and we're, we're now heading down towards the big crunch? And as I say, um, this is not, people don't understand this quite literally. Uh, there's, there's argument among the, the leading figures in the subject about it. 
And those, um, those of you who, for example, have read Stephen, some of Stephen Hawking's books and think the whole question is, reserved, uh, is, is sort of trivially solved, well, I would recommend that you also go away and read this book uh, by the Australian um, philosopher Hugh Price called Time's Arrow and Archimedes' Point. You might have cause to think again. I'm going to close my, my, my talk uh, with a quotation, in fact, from this, um, uh, this book. And Hugh Price simply says, um, and I think this is really the crunch at the heart of the problem. Nothing in physics tells us that one end of the universe is objectively the start and the other objectively the finish. So, you see, we really don't understand these, these very, very fundamental problems. If nothing else, I, I hope I can leave you with that thought. Thank you. Very good question. Um, so the question, yes, yes. The question was, um, if there were parts of the universe uh, which were at the maximum, uh, maximum entropy, that is, maximum degree of disorder that they could have, how would we observe them? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. If you, um, in, in the old days, one would simply have said, I think, well, um, the. Um, they're going to basically be, be uh, look very much like uh, the state of a, um, a gas, say, in thermal equilibrium, in a box. In other words, we'd find a totally random um, distribution in space and a t totally random distribution of, in velocity. Unfortunately, uh, life looks as if it may be a little more complicated than that because the general belief is that if you um, leave uh, any part of the universe long enough, it's uh, that. Uh, uh, then particular uh, regions where the density is somewhat greater than average are liable to end up as black holes. And uh, so uh, you could say in some sense that a, a black hole is the, um, it's probably not fair to say it's the state of maximum entropy, there are a lot of complications about that, but it is the, the final fate of much of the universe, most likely. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. There have been, um, uh, there are lots and lots of theories um, about the, uh, if you like, the gross uh, structure of the behavior of the universe in time, and some of them do indeed um, uh, assume that maybe when you go into the big crunch, you bounce out again, and that this will be the next cycle of the universe. Um, others um, assume that in some sense you go directly from here back to where you were here and, and, and go around again, et cetera, et cetera. Again, we, uh, I mean, we, we're not in a good position to know this. We are here, and it's really quite amazing we can infer anything about what's happened back, uh, back around here. Um, to infer what went on before this, if, if indeed the word before makes any sense, um, is really, I think, rather way beyond us, and has to be the subject of, of uh, speculation, on which right now at least we have absolutely no experimental information. <laughs> but there are lots and lots of speculations around Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a very, very good question. Um, so the question is, how does quantum measurement um, d uh, relate to time reversal? Um, okay, so in the standard formulation of quantum mechanics, what happens is that you start off by assigning to your system, or more precisely, the ensemble of systems technically, talking about a particular quantum state, a wave function. You then apply Schrodinger's equation and allow that wave function to evolve in time. Now, the trouble is that as long as that's all you do, well, you're going to get any information about the, the system. So you've got to make a measurement. And according to the standard quantum theory of measurement, what happens is that, for example, I have a, let me think about a particle which can have spin up or spin down, or can also be in a of these two states. And let me imagine that it is in a quantum superposition of these two states. Now I make a measurement, and that will force it, if I do the measurement in the proper way, it'll force it either to declare itself as having spin up or as having spin down. And thereafter, 
um, if I look at it uh, any further, is it will be, it will look just as if it always had spin up in one case or spin down in the other. And so the question is, um, uh, how do we reconcile that apparent asymmetry, the fact that before measurement I'm in a superposition and after measurement I'm in a definite state, how do I reconcile that with the, um, the, the statement I made that quantum mechanics does not distinguish past and future? And that's actually a rather delicate question. Um, but there's a very famous paper by Aharonov, Bergman, and Lebowitz way back in 1964, which deals with this. And what they basically show is that you can formulate quantum mechanics in a, in a time symmetric way. That is, you can decide not just to impose initial conditions, but also to impose uh, final conditions, and then ask what was the state of the system in between, as it were. Um, and um, th that gives you a well-defined theory. And then, um, if you want to, you can uh, decide to discard, as it were, part of that information. And the standard quantum mechanics that we, uh, we normally use in textbooks is obtained from the time symmetric theory by throwing away information about what's going to happen in the future. And then the justification for that, you see, is basically that we know that the thermodynamic error of time, which in, involves us and other, many other objects in the physical world, works that way around. So you're using the known asymmetry of, um, of if you like, of nature at a classical scale, non uh, you know, uh, where quantum mechanics uh, doesn't play a detailed role. We're using that to justify handling the quantum mechanical formulas in that way. Okay. That, but I, I have to say, that I, I do think, again, this is not... Uh, that's not a complete answer that I'm giving you. Um, one can ask why do we, um, in some sense, assume that the measurement apparatus is always going to work that way round and not backwards. That gets into some very, very tricky questions, I think. And these, I mean, quite literally, these are things uh, which are still being debated in the pages of the physics and philosophy journals. For those of you who have additional questions, I encourage you to come down front and talk with Professor Leggett. He's agreed to stay around for a few minutes and, and speak with people who are interested. Uh, thank you all for coming today very sure. much. Uh, we hope to see you back in two weeks for Physics Day. We have flyers out front, and you can feel free to take one on your way out. Let's thank Professor.